Okay, this is going to be in response to Scouse Capsa XS. Her video is titled, What Do You Think About FGM versus MGM? That's female genital mutilation versus male genital mutilation. First of all, this is a fairly complicated subject. They are not equal, just as two different types of female circumcision are not equal and two different types of male circumcision are not equal. However, ethically speaking, from a human rights perspective, they're both terrible. There are three main types of female circumcision. There's actually a lot more than that, but these are the three main ones. The first one is type one. Type one is the removal of the clitoris. Now that's actually the most common. Uh, a lot of people think one of these other two types that I'm going to say are, are the most common. They're not. Type two is removal of the clitoris and removal of the labia. Sometimes just the outer labia, sometimes the inner and outer labia, or just part of it. Now this is where people get confused, is most people, when they think of female circumcision, they think of type three. Type three is actually the least common, and it's uh, less than 10% of female circumcisions are type three. Now, type three is horrific beyond words. Type three is removal of the clitoris, partial removal of the inner and outer labia, and then they stitch what's left of the labia together, only leaving a tiny hole for urination and uh, menstrual blood. The reason people get this confused is because this is the one that's talked about the most in the news and stuff, and it is, they're all, they're all horrific, uh, but this is just beyond uh, any of the others. And uh, most people think that that is all of female circumcisions, and it's not. It's actually less than 10%. Still, it should be zero, of course. This is one of the reasons that makes it so difficult to compare female and male circumcision, because we have to be certain which types we're talking about. When I'm speaking generally, I'm usually speaking about type 1 because that is the most common, and that is just removal of the clitoris. It's not actually removal of all the clitoris because the clitoris actually goes deep. It goes deep inside, so it's just removal of the outer clitoris. Not that that really makes it much better, but that's technically what's happening there. There's another type of female circumcision that's less common, but I'm mentioning this because it is illegal in most Western countries. Uh, definitely illegal in the United States, Canada, and in the UK and that is just a pinprick ritual circumcision where they take a needle or just a small knife and they just make a, a very small incision or, or a very small prick just enough to um, draw some blood. They don't actually remove anything, but that is also illegal. Well, pretty much all types of male circumcision are perfectly legal, you know, complete removal and amputation of the prepuce or foreskin. So you can see right there, we already have a gender equality rights problem in the legal system itself, where you cannot even perform a pinprick ritual circumcision on a female, which does not remove anything, but you can do pretty much any type of circumcision to a male, including complete prepuce removal and complete frenulum removal. So which is worse? Which is more detrimental? Well, you can see with all these different types, it's very difficult to say. For male circumcision, there's high cut and low cut circumcisions. Some of them remove the frenulum, some of them do not. So there's three or four different types of male circumcision as well. But just for the sake of argument, let's go ahead and compare type one female circumcision, which is just clitoris removal or outer clitoris removal, to the most basic male circumcision, which is removal of the prepuce or foreskin. An argument that female circumcision in this case would be worse would be that the clitoris is the main location of touch sensation. That's where most women are, are going to get most of their pleasure and possibly even the main area to achieve orgasm. However, on the other side, the male foreskin actually has more nerve endings than the female clitoris does. The clitoris has about 8,000 nerve endings, while the foreskin has about 20,000. So there's quite a big difference there. Um, additionally, the foreskin um, is about 15 square inches of tissue, so it's actually a lot more tissue being removed. But there's also a very interesting similarity between these two, and that is that the female clitoris and the male foreskin are the main locations of fine-touch nerve receptors, or Meissner's corpuscles. When you remove the clitoris or you remove the foreskin, you're pretty much removing almost all of these fine-touch nerve receptors. So any sensation that is left is mostly pressure or pain 
and uh, vibration and several several other sensations. Fine touch is pretty much gone. Circumcised men aren't really aware of this um, because they don't know what fine touch would feel like because they don't remember before the circumcision or do they remember the circumcision itself. So they feel like what they have is normal, but basically the only sensations that they have are pressure, pain, vibration. They don't have any sense of fine touch. And this is pretty much the same for circumcised females of the type one variety. However, the circumcised male can have some fine touch nerve receptors left if the doctor did not remove his frenulum. And the frenulum is a, a small piece of skin underneath the glands. The glands is the head of the penis that goes between the glands and the shaft. And if that's not there, then the doctor likely removed it, then you pretty much don't have any fine touch nerve receptors at all. Sadly, it's actually becoming more and more common that doctors cut even further down and remove the frenulum as well, because some doctors think that the frenulum can cause problems. You know, they just want to remove anything that could possibly cause a problem. So let's look at the reasons for female and male circumcision, and we'll start with male circumcision. First of all, nobody knows why male circumcision was performed thousands of years ago. A lot of people speculate today that it had something to do with health to prevent infections and so forth, but there's actually no evidence of that whatsoever. When you look at it historically, it appears that it was pretty much just a sacrifice blood ritual. Later in the 19th century uh, in France, the UK, and in the United States, there were some ideas that circumcision would prevent boys from masturbating, and that was when it really started to popularize, and it's been popular up until today. They later came up with different things, like they said it would prevent epilepsy, and it would. they actually said things like it would prevent blindness and uh, spinal curvatures and, and all sorts of bizarre things, swelling of the tongue and all kinds of really bizarre stuff. The most common excuses today are, of course, they say that it will reduce the chances of infections, and they have a couple other things like penile cancer and stuff like that. Penile cancer is extremely rare. Uh, men are actually more likely of getting breast cancer than they are of getting penile cancer, and if they do get penile cancer, it only happens in old age. Infections are also rare. Most intact men never get an infection, while most females do get at least one infection in their lifetime. And you know what the treatment to that is. It's antibiotics, and it's the same for males. The history of female circumcision, I don't know as much about, and I actually don't think that uh, we have as good hi uh, history records on that. But it appears that it was partially down to controlling a woman's sexuality. And a lot of people think that that's still the main reason. And it, it might be part of it in certain cultures, but a lot of it, a lot of the excuses today are very similar to male circumcision. They say that it will prevent infection, prevent diseases, and so forth. It's actually women who perform the circumcisions on girls, and it's it's the mother who decides to have it done to her daughter, and very similar to here in the West, where where the father decides to have it done to his son. This is kind of a coping mechanism. You know, you don't want to admit that something is lost or something is wrong with you, so you have it done to your offspring. Quickly back to the idea of female circumcision being done to control women. Um, that's not the primary reason anymore, but it is very similar to the reasons that male circumcision was done about 100 years ago. It was done to prevent boys from masturbating, and it was even said if it was done to black men, it would keep them from raping white women. In fact, if you read some of the reasons that rabbis gave for doing this, besides being a covenant to God, when they were giving benefits of circumcision, one of the major benefits was that it reduced sensation and that it made sex less pleasurable. And we have this in writing from several different rabbis about 600 years Ago. A common argument against female circumcision is that it prevents a woman from being able to feel pleasure or to have an orgasm. And it actually turns out that that's not true. A couple studies were done and found that circumcised women did enjoy sex and most of them had orgasms. It appears that that doesn't seem to be the case, that it removes all sensation and prevents a woman from being able to orgasm. Obviously, clitoral-based orgasms are probably going to be impossible, but you know, penetrative orgasms are still possible. Just as for a man, a circumcised man, and he won't be able to achieve an orgasm from foreskin stimulation, obviously, because it's not there. And the foreskin actually contains most of the nerve endings that do cause pleasurable sensations, uh, just as for the woman, the clitoris does. Of course, if you don't ever remember having these parts, you don't know any different. And one of the most common arguments in favor of male circumcision today is the claim that it helps prevent HIV infection. And while there were some definite problems with these studies, uh, these three studies, they, they were never completed, actually, as well as many other problems, which I won't go into. But they did a few studies on circumcised women, and they found that they were half as likely to get an HIV infection. Like males, the likely reason for this is because the area stays drier, or it dries out quicker, because there's less folds of skin and places for moisture to stay trapped. 
But of course, this is assuming that, uh, that these men and women are going to be sleeping around uh, without protection, which makes it a rather strange argument. And of course, children aren't having sex at all, whereas an adult, say they wanted to be circumcised so that they could sleep around more to reduce their chance of infection, they could do that. It should be a pretty ridiculous reason. You think it would be much easier to just grab a condom. And condoms are close to 100% effective. Of course, they're not 100%, but they're very close. And most men and women do settle down at some point into a monogamous relationship, and so they're not going to be sleeping around. You would think at that point, it would be good to have all your sensations, and up until that point, you could just use a condom. But again, once you're an adult, if you really wanted to have genital surgery, you could have that done. So it's really ridiculous to even think about having this done to children who don't get a choice in the matter. I certainly haven't covered everything here. Like I said, it's a very complex topic, and there's a whole lot to cover, and I'm just winging it. So I know I'm not covering everything, and I only have a time span of about 10 minutes for YouTube. But in closing, are they equal? No, but also two types of male circumcision are not equal and two types of female circumcision are not equal. Um, the way in which they are equal is they're both equal violations of human rights to genital integrity. And type 1 female circumcision, which is the most common, has many common parallels to the most common type of male circumcision. So they are very similar in many ways. And that's it. I'll close it there. Thank you for listening.